If you're a woman with belly fat, you will never lose it unless you do the following five things. Ooh. All right, first let's get into the causes of belly fat because now there's excessive body fat that you gain on your body that comes from, to put it simply, of course it's more complex than this, but to put it simply, you're, you're, you're not burning as many calories as you're taking in or you're taking in more calories than you're burning. So your body stores body fat. But what happens to some women is they start to notice that their body fat distribution changes a bit and they start to accumulate more body fat in their belly region uh, or more visceral belly fat, which they might not have had in the past. Like the classic way that women gain, you know, store body fat tends to be in the hip and thighs mm -hmm. uh, area, whereas men tend to store it in the belly. But a lot of women will experience this, especially as they get older or during like a life uh, change. Like all of a sudden, like I'm gaining weight, but I'm not gaining like I used to. It's right now around my belly, and I've had a lot of clients talk to me about this. And as a young trainer, I just said, "Oh, you just got to get leaner." I think it's you know, I, I used to think, "Well, it's, I think it's in your imagination. You just store body fat <laughs> where, you, where you store it." Right. But now we have a lot of data showing that this actually happens, and there's some causes. Yeah, this is actually, and not just uh, common in, in women. It's also common in men for the same reason. Mm. I, I mean, they whenever this, I didn't know this early, just like you, early on. Uh, you know, my clients would say that and I'd be like, oh, I would say it was unique to the individual, not something particularly going on in your life, right? right? Like, oh yeah, like some people store body fat around their hips or some people store it more there. Some people have low back fat more like- And then they'd say, so, no, 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 it's not the same. Yeah, they'd yeah. be like, that's how I used to be yeah. too. I used to go right to here. Before. But what's weird is that it's now seems to be here and I just, I didn't have the answer because I didn't understand this until later on. And again, it, it this happens both to men. So- if you're somebody, male or female, that is suffering from this or realize that my body is just storing body fat different than it ever has, it's almost always a clear indication that something is off with your hormone profile. Hormones, yeah. So hormones can drive, uh, they, they influence how body fat gets stored in the body. So with women in particular, uh, you start to see this imbalance between estrogen and progesterone. And then both men and women, you see more insulin resistance in connection to belly fat. So uh, having or developing insulin resistance. So insulin resistance is when your body isn't reacting or um, it's, it's not being signaled by the insulin you're producing like it used to. So your body has to produce more insulin to give the same effect. So let's say you eat a meal, classic example, you eat a meal containing carbohydrates or sugar that gets digested, released in the bloodstream, body you know releases insulin insulin tells that that sugar or those carbohydrates to get shuttled into the, the body or into the muscle or the liver and if you're in if your body's not reacting to insulin like it used to you need to produce more insulin in order to make this happen and then of course over time this turns into diabetes but even before it becomes diabetes if your body's becoming insulin resistant this is um, this 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 is metabolic illness in essence. Your 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 cells just aren't reacting, responding the way they need to, and they they they've found this correlation for a long time. More belly fat more, means more insulin resistance, but more mm -hmm. insulin resistance also means more body fat. So that's one of the main causes. Is there's a change in your hormones, and there's always a root as to why the hormones are changing. Yeah, I mean, is this directly connected also to the stress uh, that can cause that also, right? So you, it's not just uh, somebody's age uh, at what point in their life, but also they can actually be causing some of this hormonal change based off of all the outside stress or internal stress that they're perceiving, right? Yeah, because uh, so stress causes um, a rise in cortisol. Now, cortisol, you know, we, for, we often hear that referred to as the stress hormone. Um, and it's like this bad thing. Cortisol is not bad. It's an ascent, it's a hormone. We need it. Um, but the pro the a nice healthy cortisol profile looks something like this. You see a spike in the morning when you need to wake up, and it slowly drops and it's low in the evening, so you can go to sleep. When you're under this kind of constant level of stress, uh, low level stress or moderate stress um, over time, what you tend to see is this inverted uh, cortisol. Uh, release where cortisol is low in the morning, need lots of caffeine to get up and wake up. And then it starts to rise midday and stay high in the evening. And now you can't sleep even though you're exhausted. And then overall cortisol is just higher for longer periods of time. And cortisol also changes fat storage 
uh, profile. It actually changes distribution as well. It's also connected to more, in particular, visceral body fat. And then even if you, if you boil it down even more, visceral body fat in the abdomen area. So that's one of the pieces of that hormone uh, profile that's off is your cortisol is a little messed up because your stress isn't being managed uh, properly. Well, that, okay, so in this category of stress, would you also place like a, an event, like a, you're having a child and then going through that whole process, like in terms of it just being a, uh, you know, quite a quite a traumatic uh, stress on the body, like physically, like and how that would change and shape profile? Because, I mean, in terms of that kind of changing the whole chemistry and then, you know, obviously – changing and shifting like uh location job all these other things like being stressors um you know that all that kind of stuff is going to play into this it can and it's mostly connected to chronic stress so we're supposed to experience for lack of a better term supposed to right uh you know it's like acute. periods of stress yeah acute stress but what right. what tends to be damaging is this long like like years of stress or 6 months or a year of just this kind of like this 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 uh, you know higher than normal amount of stress, or just my ability to manage stress may be may be different, right? Mm -hmm. Where let's say before you had some quiet time in your schedule, or you were able to do things for yourself, and now your schedule doesn't allow it. So now your normal life is is not you can't manage the stress like you used to. Right. So the normal stress now becomes more than you can manage. And then that causes that cortisol dysfunction. Yeah, I was just going to say, I'm trying to think of a, a scenario where I've seen these independent of each other. Like most times they come, yeah. they, they almost come in pairs almost always. Mm -hmm. Like normally if I have a client that has hormone imbalances that we're trying to get to the bottom of, they normally also have some sort of excessive stress, chronic, chronic stress going on also. Rarely, I'm trying to think of an example where... I've seen these uh, independent of each other. Can you, do you recall having a lot of clients like that where like you didn't have both in that scenario? No, it's almost always the case uh, except for cases of like perimenopause or menopause where you start to see hormone changes sure. mm -hmm. right. um, happen anyway. Which is and, the inevitable, right? Like yes. that's, that, that's the, uh, there's, there's an example. Okay. That's a good example. Yeah. I've had healthy clients, totally fine, good, good management of stress most of their life. And then they hit that age. Yes. And then that, that happens. Yeah, and that happens these days. Uh, sometimes women in their, as, as young, and is in their mid 30s, mid -30s. Yeah. usually 40s where you start to see this and then you'll hear them say like oh my body's just storing body fat differently now there's a lot you could do and we'll get to the solutions by the way there's a lot you could do that mitigates this uh, quite a bit but again hormone changes uh, right cortisol adjust, uh, you know estrogen progesterone low testosterone uh, this is another one insulin resistance and low testosterone go hand in hand and this is by the way I'm talking about women so testosterone is is you know commonly known as the male hormone, but it's just as important for women as it is for men. Now, there's a difference in how much testosterone is optimal for women and men. Obviously, women, it's much lower, but if a woman's testosterone is too low, she gets the same symptoms that a man with low testosterone gets. Low energy, low libido, uh, higher rates of depression, brain fog, and loss of muscle and increased rates uh, of storage of body fat. And then insulin resistance tends to follow because of some of those downstream effects uh, of the low testosterone. Do you recall, uh, so we just had a call last night with our GLP-1 group and uh, Dr. Lauren was in there talking and she went through the list of almost every one of her female clients, once they get to a certain age, she almost recommends mm -hmm. almost all, there was thyroid, progesterone. Mm -hmm. Thyroid, progesterone, and testosterone, uh, and DHEA. Those are uh, the four, right? Tend to be the ones that she works okay, with so, the most. Yeah. Yeah, so um, next, uh, another one of the causes of this is just loss of muscle. So here's an interesting statistic. Uh, after the age of 30, the average woman will lose four to six pounds of muscle per decade. So if she does nothing, if she does no strength training, if she's not trying to offset this, wow. every 10 years, she's losing between four to six pounds of muscle. And this doesn't account for the loss of muscle quality. So although the scale may show you lost five pounds of muscle, mm -hmm. the muscle that you kept isn't the same quality because one pound of muscle is not equal to one pound of muscle. You see a pound of muscle on an athlete versus a pound of muscle on a sedentary individual they are not the same metabolically. They're not the same when it comes to insulin sensitivity. They're, they're, you know, they don't have the same fatty deposits. They're, one pound of healthy muscle is not the same as one pound of unhealthy muscle. So aside from the muscle loss, you also see this degrading of the muscle health every single 10 years. I can't help but think though that 
that statistic is exacerbated because of the previous two. Oh yeah, it's yeah. all they all. In yes. fact, feeds it, into that. Yeah. The, yeah, I would say the loss of muscle plays a bigger role in, into those two, and then you see that like oh, you said, sure. a positive feedback loop. Uh -huh. Yeah, because uh -huh. I, I the one thing I've never liked about studies like that that show that is the average person hears that and goes like, oh shit, this just getting older sucks, yeah. or just this is the inevitable that's going to happen to me as I age. I'm supposed to lose all this muscle, so I never like that because I feel like that sends the wrong the wrong message. It's really like okay. What that is, is decades of not strength training, not hitting your protein intake, not mitigating your stress, getting good sleep, doing all the big rocks, mm -hmm. right? Therefore, because of that, what statistics show is as you age, you're going to lose four to six pounds of that. So I just think it's so important to, to talk about how connected those all are. And it's not just because you're getting older, you're going to lose that kind of muscle. It's because of those things you're not right. doing causes a, a whole host of things. Hey, sorry to interrupt. Look, I have a free guide that teaches you how to lose fat in three steps, just three steps that will burn the most amount of body fat and help keep it off. This guide is totally free. We're giving it to everybody right now. If you want it, click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. Thanks. 100%. We'll get more into this when we get into the solutions here, but um, you, you know, losing muscle means you're losing insulin sensitivity because muscles are extremely insulin sensitive. Losing muscle means that your body is changing its hormone profile to pair muscle down, right? Building muscle, you need a youthful hormone profile. Well, you're losing all your extra gas tanks, yeah, right? Yes. Like, I mean, that's kind of a, the simpler way to look at it. Like muscle is this great storage for all the excess carbohydrates that you consume. And so if you lose four or five pounds of muscle off your body, that was an additional X amount of calories your body could actually healthily store, that it right. would store and put to work and use. You now lose that. So what happens now that you you over, well, if you over consume, now that gets stored as body fat. Where in the past, if you had that five pounds of muscle, the muscle, it would shuttle over into the muscles and fill the muscle bellies. Up. That's a huge difference. Having those five pounds of muscle, though, that gets shuttled over there. You actually look better. You feel better. You can use that. Mm -hmm. You lose that. The same calorie intake, don't change anything else. Now that same calorie intake ends up being over spillage and gets stored as body fat. That's right. And, you, and muscle is also a, a stress absorbing tissue on the body. We know this with data. If you go into a stressful situation, a surgery, an injury, an illness, mm -hmm. the more muscle you have, the 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 higher the odds of of definitely of survival. Much more resilient. But of coming, yes, so much more resilient uh, with more muscle. So loss of muscle is a big one. Um, the next one is under eating and over training. So and these go hand in hand. Um, unfortunately, the message that has been told to pretty much everybody, but especially to women, is that in order for you to be healthy. You need to eat less, 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 and less, and less. So mm -hmm. as your metabolism is slowing down, as you're losing muscle, oh, you got to keep eating less, got to keep eating less. And then to be fit and healthy, you need to beat the crap out of yourself by extra, by over applying the stress of exercise. And so you get these underfed, overtrained, flabby individuals with hormone imbalances who don't understand why they're losing a little bit of weight, but really it's just their arms and legs that are getting skinny. They still have a you know uh, belly fat. They don't feel good. They, they eat one weekend, they go out and eat, and they gain all this weight, and they can't figure out what the hell's going on, even though they're trying to do the right things because they're beating themselves up in the gym. It's because they're over-applying intensity with exercise. It's not appropriate. They're not training themselves properly, typically over-training, and they underfeed themselves, in particular protein. Oh, yeah, this is the classic Karen at Orange Theory or F45. I mean, this is the they eat two salads a day, and uh, you know a Frappuccino is like the, all the calories mm -hmm. they consume. And then they run through these like circuit-based types of class and burn, try and burn all their calories off, and they just get stuck in this awful cycle of maybe they're not gaining any more body fat, but they're not losing any, and they're kind of staying the same place. Just With all this hard work and no food. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and then and so addicted to the uh, <clears throat> adrenaline and endorphins and cortisol dump that they get from the class, thinking that they're doing something good for their body. Because, man, after they get done beating themselves up for that, that feels I feel so good and so accomplished afterwards, not realizing that you're they're addicted to that feeling because their body is starving of having a good, healthy balance of hormones. And so... This is a vicious cycle that um, I, I I tend to train a lot of clients like this that 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 ran into this and then and I'd you have apply to the right things is that everything changes like magic. 100 percent. Next up is the metabolic adaptation that happens from all the things that we listed. Metabolic adaptation literally means your metabolism is adapting. Now in this case, your metabolism is slowing down. What you used to be able to eat, you no longer can. Now you eat it. Now you gain body fat. Now your body reacts. You can't figure out why. You're eating so little, 
and yet you're still, you know, X amount of pounds overweight. You can't figure it out. And it's because your metabolism is slowed down to a snail's pace. And, and, but, and this is real. This is a real thing. We see this with clients yep. all the time. Women that are coming in that are tracking their calories, consuming 1,000 to 1,200 calories a day, who still have 20 pounds to lose, who are doing cardio step classes five you know, days a week or Orange Theory or whatever, five days a week. Can't figure out what the hell's going on. Definitely don't want to eat less because I'm barely eating anything to begin with and just feel like garbage. There's just no room for them to go. No. Yeah, they're so low calorie and it's this is really where they might eat a cookie and it they will feel the impact of that. You yep. know, it's just like that excess amount, a couple hundred more calories, and you know, it's gonna change their their physique uh at that point because they're so again, they're they're overtrained, they're low calorie, and this is just like something they've they've just gradually adapted to this really um, you know, inefficient uh, way to metabolize everything. Meanwhile, all our peers, this is one of those things that we find ourselves arguing, debating over when people use words like, oh, your your metabolism is broken and then you have the professionals come out that's not what your metabolism broken and then they make people think that oh, okay well then my metabolism is fine when we're really what's going on is that it's your metabolism supposed to do. is doing exactly what it's supposed to do you're starving it you're pushing it like crazy and you're telling it to survive off of what you're doing and so it becomes efficient it learns that. how to do that yeah so you know and it's unfortunate because again it turns into one of these things where all the science nerds want to try and argue over the terminology that's used to explain what's going on but this it's a true phenomenon that happens a lot and a lot of coaches and trainers don't know what to do when they all they their only tool the only tool that they use in their tool belt is the move more burn you know or burn more eat less strategy and this person has got themselves in this situation where that strategy no longer serves them. They no. are now at such a low calorie to the example you gave. And I've seen this countless times where they are tracking, they are weighing, they are measuring, they are eating 1200 calories and they are doing stuff activity every single day, yet they can't lose that last 20 pounds. No, what it tends to look like is they lost an initial whatever and then plateaued hard and then they have nowhere else to go. They don't know mm -hmm. where else to go. And now just to maintain the weight loss that they did <laughs> create, they have to maintain this crazy schedule of eating very little and moving like crazy. And it's your metabolism has adapted. By the way, there's a way to get your metabolism to, ad to adapt the, other, the way. other way, right? right? There are things you can do. And if you do them right, you can also speed up your metabolism in an effective way. Just like it slowed down, uh, it, you know, in which case you did that on accident. Well, we can on purpose speed it up. So here's the fix. Let's start with the first thing. Number one, lift weights. There is nothing you can do exercise-wise that is more effective at reducing belly fat in particular, visceral body fat in particular, like strength training. Now, why is that? Well, strength training directly builds muscle. Now, before I hear you, you know, yelling at the screen or, or, or saying to yourself, well, I, you know, I, I, I feel my muscles burn in my orange theory. And, you know, I feel my legs burning when I'm going for runs. No, no, no. They don't build muscle. Those forms of exercise do not build muscle. You'll get a little bit of strength, but mostly what you're getting is endurance, which is fine if that's what you want, but they are not directly affecting your muscles in a build sense, in a gain muscle sense, in a speed up your metabolism sense. Only traditional strength training will do this. What does that look like? That looks like you do 10 reps of something with something heavy, good form, good technique. Right? Rest. And then you rest. You rest <laughs> for two minutes, three minutes. Then you do another set. It is not going from exercise to exercise to exercise to exercise with no rest. It is not running on a treadmill nonstop or doing a class nonstop and, and sweating your butt off, you know, whatever. It's not that. That does not send a signal to the body that says build muscle. Only traditional strength training will do that. And when you build that muscle, here's the beauty of this, right? Building muscle dramatically improves insulin sensitivity. It also tells your body to organize its hormones in a way to build muscle. So if you're trying to get your body to build muscle and you do so with a nice, with good, appropriate strength training, the first thing your body does is it changes its hormone profile to do so. And it does this through a few different ways. One is it actually changes your hormone profile, but two, it changes receptor density. For example, strength training directly increases what are, what are what is known as androgen receptor density. All right, what are androgen receptors? These are the receptors that testosterone attaches to. So if you had good testosterone as a woman, remember testosterone is important for women too. If you have good testosterone in your, in your system, but there are no receptors to attach to, it does nothing. It just, just swims around your system and it's like, might as well not be there. The only way it can work is if it attaches to a receptor. Well, when you build muscle, 
you increase the number of these receptors. So even if your testosterone levels stay the same, for example, if your testosterone stayed the same, but you doubled your androgen receptor density, you've essentially doubled your testosterone. That's how effective it is. And building muscle does it. It also speeds up your metabolism. You gain muscle and you move in that direction, your body burns more calories. Muscle is active tissue that requires more calories to maintain than other tissues. So building muscle, we talked about metabolic adaptation. You can also get your metabolism to adapt in the other way by simply building muscle. I think it's so important to talk, you know, even further, you mentioned it, but further with the mindset that goes into how you lift. Because when I would get this, the same client that's a, a, that we're kind of describing, right, the avatar, and then can you 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 drop all the science knowledge that you just did, and you say, hey, let's we're gonna we're gonna lift weights to to build muscle, and they go, okay, I, I, you've sold me on that, I'm gonna start doing that. They still do it with the wrong mindset. They do it with the idea of still beating themselves up, still trying to accomplish more in the workout, still trying to get good at the workout to where it becomes easy versus going into it with the idea of like, I need to get stronger. My goal is week over week, I want to be able to add more weight to the bar and lift more weight. And the truth is, it may, it may never get easier for me. It's just I'm going to be constantly challenging myself and challenging my body to lift more weight to get strong. That is going to send the loudest signal to your body to build muscle, not this doing weights. Okay, I'm ready. I can do it again. Doing weights again. Okay, I'm ready. I can do it again. And this circuit-based type of training that I think so many of them are addicted to. So how you go into the lifting weights, I think is so important because many times this client is attracted to the type of weight training that is not benefiting them. Very no, much. no. And I'll take it a step further. If you look at the data, and by the way, we've, we, we know this through anecdote, through training all the clients that we've, we have over the last two and a half decades. But you look at the data on weight loss, uh, when the ways that the people lose weight is through cardio plus calorie deficit. In other words, people drop their calories and they did cardio. A significant percentage of the weight that they lose is muscle. They will lose 10 pounds, but four pounds or 40% of it comes from muscle. Now, why does this happen? By the way, this doesn't happen with strength training. In those studies where they use strength training, it's almost all body fat, or sometimes it's all body fat and they gain a little bit of muscle. So in other words, you lose 10 pounds, it's 10 pounds of body fat, not six pounds of fat, four pounds of muscle. All right, why does cardio cause us to lose muscle in that scenario? Well, it's because cardio is asking your body to improve its endurance, not strength. Endurance doesn't require bigger, stronger muscles. It requires efficient muscles. Also, cardio on its own does burn a lot of calories, which your body adapts to, but it does burn a lot of calories. So your body learns how to do that activity better, efficiently, more yeah. efficiently by burning less calories. How does it do that? It <clears throat> pairs muscle down. The best example I can give you, a visual example of the difference between strength training and cardio is a long distance runner versus a sprinter. Sprinters are essentially doing strength training when they run. They're sprinting for Anaerobic. short distances. Right. They, have, they are muscular and lean versus low muscle uh, marathon runners. So if you want to lose muscle, cardio is the way to go. If you want to keep your muscle, speed up your metabolism while getting leaner, improve insulin sensitivity, all of the above, then you will lift weights. And you will lift weights like somebody who's trying to get stronger and build muscle, not like somebody who's just trying to burn a lot of calories. Hey, sorry to interrupt. Look, this episode is brought to you by 8sleep, the most advanced sleep system you'll find anywhere. It goes over your bed, warms, cools your bed, and it adjusts its temperature based off of how you move in bed and sleep. Go check them out. Go to 8sleep.com forward slash mind pump. Use the code mind pump, get $350 off their pod for ultra. All right, back to the show. I feel like I have to reorder this because with that, it's so important that you pair it with eating in a calorie yeah, surplus yeah, and definitely. eating high protein because this will even this alone, if you're still trapped in that eating two salads and a, you know, coffee a day is your, 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 cause you're afraid you're going to put more body fat on and which is totally understandable to this client. This client has been eating a thousand calories, doing all this high activity. And you say, I'm going to cut this activity out from you. And now I want you to slow down your workouts and strength train and take rest periods. And then, uh, then you try and tell that client, Oh, and by the way, I'm also going to have you increase calories and bump your protein and take them out. You scare the shit out of yeah. that person, but it's absolutely necessary because 
what happens when we go to the gym and we lift properly the way we're supposed to, we send the loud signal for us, hey, to go tell the body to go build muscle. But if you don't give it what it needs to actually go do that, then all you're doing is sending a loud signal and the body isn't adapting. It isn't growing. It isn't building muscle. And so it's imperative that not only do we train a certain way, but then we also feed the body appropriately in order to reap the real benefits of building it's, muscle. It's like sending a, a bunch of blueprints to construction workers to build a house. With no tools. No yeah. no tools, no yeah. wood, no sheetrock, yeah, no nothing. It's exactly like that. You can't build anything. It's like, so, it's great. It's great. You have all the plans. You got all the plans and you have all the direction, but you don't give them the you tools to work. You have to feed your body the nutrients it needs to build muscle. All right, what does that look like? Let's get specific. Eat one gram of protein per pound of target body weight, okay? So whatever the weight is that you want to weigh, it's 120 pounds, 150 pounds, whatever, that's how many grams of protein you need to eat on an, ready for this, every single day basis. Mm -hmm. Not sometimes, yeah. but every single day. And not an average too, so I want, you know, somebody brought that up recently and I was like, you know what, we haven't talked a lot about that on the show and we should talk about that more often because you talk about, calorie average is okay, right? It's about how undulating your calories and the average when it comes to weight loss or weight gain is so important. But you can't do that with protein. No, protein needs to be consistent because we don't really have an effective way of storing protein like we do fat or carbohydrates, right? Carbohydrates get stored as glycogen fat. Obviously, it could get stored in body fat. But protein needs to be consistent. In other words, you can't have a super high protein day and then a bunch of low protein days and average it out and say it's, it's all the same. It doesn't really work that way. You want to have it on a consistent basis. So if your go if if your target body weight is 150 pounds, and you're eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner, guess what? You're eating 50 grams of protein for breakfast, mm -hmm. 50 grams of protein for lunch, 50 grams of protein for dinner. Now, a lot of people don't know what that looks like. A lot of people listening to this right now is like, okay, I'll eat a high protein breakfast. Yeah, I'll like have nine, ten ounces have, of meat. Yeah, I'll have two scrambled eggs. No, no, no. 50 grams of protein of eggs is what is that? Eight eggs, something like that. It's like yes. around eight eggs. So. It's a decent size. So you need to have like eight ounces of meat uh, or eight ounces of some kind of protein for breakfast. You need to do the same thing with lunch, same thing with dinner. Eat it first, prioritize it. That's going to give you most of the nutrients that you need. Now, of course, you can't just eat protein. You need to have some fats and some carbohydrates. But I'm not worried so much about that because when people tend to prioritize the protein, the other especially if they get it from whole food yeah, sources, the other stuff comes. The other stuff tends to come. Yeah. So do that. And if you don't, you can lift all the weights in the world. You could train perfectly uh, with strength training. If your protein's low, you're going to build very little muscle. If it's too low, you'll build no muscle. It doesn't right. even matter at all. All right. Next up uh, is to have some kind of a spiritual practice for stress. Now this could be meditation. It could be obviously prayer, but when you look at the data, now here's why, here's why we put this in there for stress management. When you look at the data on managing stress, there are two very powerful ways that you can manage stress. One is to change your lifestyle. Okay, so you got a stressful job, you got a mortgage, you got three kids, uh, you know, you you you've got a spouse or whatever. You could change all that and in, in hope in hopes that it'll completely change your stress. Although you might switch jobs, find a job that's just as stressful. You probably don't want to get rid of your kids. I think if you did, you'd probably be more stressed out than, than you were before. So sometimes the reason why I'm saying this is sometimes our lives we can change to make less stressful, but oftentimes it's just life. Like it's just, this is a season of life. It's stressful. So the data shows us very clearly, either you change your life, your lifestyle, but if that's not really uh, something that is, is, is possible for you in a big way, incorporating some kind of a spiritual practice, especially starting the day out with it has significant impact on how your body manages the normal stress of your life. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's studies that show that people who wake up in the morning and engage in 10 to 15 minutes of prayer or meditation, that's it. Mm -hmm. The amount, the, the type of stress that they, or at least the way that they perceive the stress throughout the day, their normal stress is reduced significantly. So for most people, my experience training people, when I did this with clients, it was easier for them to do this than it was for them to do this overhaul of their life. Now, sometimes it was something they could do, like you're, you're dating somebody that's that's toxic. Let's break up with them and then boom, stress is gone. But other times it's like, I, look, I got kids, I got a job, like I, I can't change it. These are important things for me. Incorporating some kind of a spiritual practice tends to give us a sense of purpose, takes us out of those stressful things and starting the day out that way it tends, it, it, the, the, the theory is that it primes the central nervous system mm -hmm. to receive the stress differently throughout the rest of the day. That's why it's so important to do this 
first thing in the morning if you're going to incorporate this. And, and the data shows as little as five to 10 to 15 Why minutes. Why should it be any different than the body? We do it for workouts. You know, this is for our mind and our, our mental uh, ability. And I think too, like really acknowledging the fact that there's like, we're, we're like control animals. Like we just want to figure out how to uh, predict things in our environment, how to manage all these things. But there are factors. There's a lot going on here that we have no control over and to acknowledge that right away and to just stay with what you can control. It relieves this excess amount of, uh, stress and, and things that can accumulate really fast that really are unnecessary for you to carry around with you that adds to uh, this this dysfunctional stress that you're going to carry. I find this conversation really interesting because this has been this has been in societies and, and a part of uh, many, many cultures for a very, very long thousands time. Thousands of years. Yeah, thousands of years. And uh, But it does feel like uh, it is more important today than it's ever been. And I think it's just because people need to be reminded, you know, we we've created so many things in just the last few decades that causes this, like us distracting and taking us from being present. Mm -hmm. Like you just so much of life just a hundred years ago forced you to be present. I mean, just your daily activities, feeding yourself, like the things that you would have to do to get through your day required so many moments of being present in yourself, in your body right there at that time. And today it's so different. I mean, we can't even go to the bathroom or wait in a line or have downtime between something at work without this, this appendage that we grab right to and, and distract ourselves with that's so addicting. And it's like, and I don't think that we understand fully what that's doing to our bodies and so these these practices, whether you believe in a higher power or not, I think are it's going to be have to be adopted by everybody. So you can deny the 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 higher power part and the, the maybe the spiritual side, but the practice of you know not being distracted, being hyper present, um, it, and what that does is it, it takes away like when we stress out. That's because we're either dwelling on the past or the future. And being present gets eliminates that. Mm -hmm. If I'm 100% in this moment, I'm not worried about all the shit that's going to happen in the future. I'm not stressed out about what happened yesterday or last year. I'm in the moment. And so that practice of getting you to do that, whether you do that from a, a spiritual standpoint or you have some sort of way of doing that, it's just it's going to become necessary for everybody. It's, 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 it's always been necessary. But what's happened is we've created all these time-saving devices and tools. And what's ended up happening is we've actually given ourselves less and less time, made ourselves more and more busy. By the way, this isn't just, I mean, we're not just, this isn't our opinion. The data shows uh, anxiety, um, not forget depression, but anxiety, which is, you know, stress causes anxiety, right? Could also cause depression, but anxiety is, is at peak levels. Like what is going on? We have more stuff than ever. We have more entertainment than ever. And uh, a lot of experts believe it's Loss of this, 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 we're, we're not taking this 10,000 foot view of things anymore. Whereas this was a regular practice. This was a part of society. It's no longer part of society. And again, the data on this is clear. It's like, you could try changing the things in your life to dramatically reduce your stress. But if a lot of your stress is from stuff that you can't change because it's life and life is hard, then changing your outlook and changing yourself will do that. And the spiritual practice will do this. And it doesn't take much. Again, the data that I've seen shows 5, 10, 15 minutes a day. That's it. In the morning. Most of us have that in the morning. And what we tend to do with that in the morning is scroll through social media. 10 minutes social media in the morning. By the way, that does the opposite. That primes the central nervous system for alarm because social media is all alarm. It's all about what the other person is doing. It's all about crazy news, political news, scary stuff. Now you've primed your central nervous system for worry and anxiety and stress versus priming your central nervous system for purpose and meaning and larger thought. And then that sets you up for the rest of the day. And then something stressful happens and it's not as stressful. Now your perception is, is totally changed. All right. Next up is to get good sleep. So we talked about the morning. Let's talk about the night. Sleep is the most recuperative reju rejuvenating thing you can do for your body. Good sleep has a profound effect on balancing hormones. Bad sleep or inadequate sleep has also an equally profound negative effect on your hormones. I mean, you could you could you could lower your testosterone dramatically with two nights of 
bad sleep, or you could throw your estrogen progesterone way off with one or two nights of poor sleep. So what is good sleep? It's about seven to eight hours of good, solid sleep every single night. Not six hours or six and a half hours. It's seven to eight of good quality sleep. And, and the way that this happens, the way that you can get this, and, and now we can give you the steps and what to do, and we, we'll talk about that, but really it boils down to prioritizing it. I'm going to prioritize good sleep, meaning I'm going to make sure I'm in bed by this time, which gives me eight and a half hours before I need to wake up because you know it's going to take you about 20, 30 minutes to fall asleep. So I'm going to go to bed at this time and I'm going to wake up at this time. I'm going to keep the go to bed and wake up times the same every single day so I don't jet lag myself Monday morning because I slept in Saturday you know, and Sunday because I went to bed so late. And then I'm going to set myself up. What does that mean? An hour before, I'm getting ready for bed. What does that look like? I'm calming things down. I'm dimming the lights or turning them down or going by candlelight. I'm not watching things that are alarming. I'm not reading the news. I'm calming myself down, maybe reading a book, getting myself into that state where now I'm ready to go to bed versus what we tend to do, which is go, 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 and then time for bed, hit the pillow, expect to have quality sleep. doesn't work that way. You know, my favorite part about helping, helping clients with this hack of like, focusing on sleep is that when you look at like trying to be a healthier version of yourself, we look at exercise, we look at diet, we look at sleep, hydration, all these things. And, you know, sometimes days get away from us where you get so busy and you didn't eat the perfect meal or you missed a meal or whatever, or you didn't get a chance to make it to the gym. And so what I love about teaching clients the importance of prioritizing sleep is that it's the thing at the end of the night that it's like, hey, I didn't do this, I didn't do that and this, but I can at least do this. And so, and that is such a big rock in the grand scheme of things when you're trying to get a healthier version of yourself, especially when we're talking about hormone profiles and belly fat and trying to solve that. It's like, hey, you know what? Tomorrow we'll get up, we'll try and hit the diet better. Tomorrow we'll try and be better about the gym, but you still have tonight, you still have got that. So it's like, and to me, it's like, if if you're a client of mine and you you, you missed out on those first two things, you still have this opportunity to go, hey, you know what? Like, I'm still going to make today like somewhat of a success by practicing some of these other things. And this, I think they feed into each other when you talk about a spiritual practice, yeah. doing something like that before you go to bed since you're prioritizing. It's like, hey, I didn't do those other things, but you know what I'm going to do is I, I had such an overwhelming day. I'm going to make sure two, three hours before I shut everything down. I'm actually going to either do prayer, meditation, yoga, whatever it is to be hyper present in the moment. And then I'm going to make sure that I go to bed and get a good night's rest that set me up for success on the next day. I just think if people went into their day with that attitude of knowing that they can still win the day by setting their night up and having totally. a good night's rest to set up the tone for the next day. I think maybe they wouldn't beat themselves up so much about maybe the, the the one bad meal they had or missing the workout for the day because that's such a big piece is to get good sleep. And if you if you screwed up on the other things, it's just going to get compounded by also just riding off the sleep too. Yeah, there, still save that. There was a there was a study that showed that I've quoted this one many times that they had two groups uh, of people both going to calorie deficit, so both eat low calories, both lost the same amount of weight, but one group that had them have terrible sleep, so they limited them to I think five and a half hours, six hours of sleep. The other group, they prioritize good sleep. They both lost the same amount of weight, but one group lost twice as much muscle and half as much body fat. It's crazy. So they both lost, I don't remember how many pounds it was, but the group with the bad sleep lost twice as much muscle and half as much body fat. And that was the only difference was the bad sleep. All right, lastly, get your hormones checked. Now, you don't want to get your hormones checked by your general practitioner. No. Because they tend to base it off of certain ranges. They don't look at symptoms. You want to go to somebody who works with hormone replacement therapy. This can be a godsend if indeed this is something that you need um, and that works for you. Um, it, you know, I uh, now after having spoken to many, many experts uh, in this area, in this arena, many of them say, oh, hormone replacement therapy is a godsend. If somebody's exercising and they're trying to eat right and they're leading a healthy lifestyle and they're, you know, 43 years old and we do these tests and we see thyroid is low, your, your testosterone's a bit low, and we start to supplement with bioidentical hormones, profound difference in the way that people feel, profound improvement in quality of life. And those and hormone replacement therapy in the context of a healthy person, it, it, it's, it improves longevity. Now, in the context of somebody who's very unhealthy and inflamed, then you don't waste your time. But if you're doing all the stuff that we're talking about and you get your hormones checked, 
and you're going to, you know, let's say a functional medicine practitioner or somebody in a longevity clinic, and they're like, yeah, we could give you some progesterone, a little bit of estrogen, some testosterone, thyroid, really balance things out. You will notice a profound difference uh, in your results in terms of fat loss, muscle gain, libido, energy, sleep, all of the above. So that would be the last thing that I would say. I mean, do. I don't even know if it's a last thing for me. I think almost towards the back half of my career, anytime I was training anybody over the age of 40, if they haven't had it checked, I almost always, especially if they they were struggling. Panel, at least. Yeah, especially if they were struggling, right? Like mm -hmm. they're like, Adam, I eat good. I train, I do these things. And they're like, still frustrated. I'm seeing results. result. When did you get your blood work done? Mm -hmm. When have you had somebody besides the general practitioner look at your blood panels and go over that with you? If you hadn't, I would almost always send my clients mm -hmm. first to that. So at least mm -hmm. give us some insight because- What's tough as a trainer is if their if their hormones are really out of whack and, and really imbalanced, and I'm I'm pulling all these levers with diet and sleep right. and exercise, man. We're, so a lot of times you'll see minimal minimal like results from all that great effort mm -hmm. because that because the hormone profiles are simply just getting that healthy in an optimal place. All of a sudden, all of that effort and it starts to yeah. really pay itself off. So almost always do I recommend somebody that has struggled with weight loss and feels like they have ate or eating well, they've trained, they've done the things and they're not seeing the results, go see a specialist. And all these things directly impact your body's ability to burn body fat, but in particular, the distribution of where you store body fat, like we said earlier with belly fat versus the other uh, areas. Hey, sorry to interrupt. It's October. MAPS Muscle Mommy is 50% off, half off. If you're interested, click on the link below. All right, back to the show. All right, I think we have some questions, Doug. In we do. To the first one is, how long should I reverse diet before going back to a calorie deficit for Ooh. fat loss? So let's define a reverse diet first. So reverse diet, let's say let's say you're somebody who, you know, we defined earlier, you're eating 1,200 calories a day, you've been working out like crazy, you just listen to this episode, you're like, okay, what do I do? Well, one of the things you do is you start strength training, cut out all the other workouts, get good sleep, the whole thing. But also, we're going to do a reverse diet because your calories are too low. The calories are too low for us to lose body fat with because where are we going to go from 1200 down to 800 700 calories it's not going to happen so what you do is you slowly increase your calories over time while strength training build muscle speed up your metabolism until you get to a point where you can then cut from and then burn body fat so the question is how long do you reverse diet before going to a calorie Deficit. I like the way you've explained this before, Adam, if you don't mind. I actually have an, a kind of, so I was waiting for to say something because I actually kind of have a new way to say this, that it, it's because of where I'm at currently right now. So my goal of my whole process right now is to reduce body fat. Like I was at 15%. I want to get into single digits, but I'm coming from a place, obviously not as broken, maybe as somebody who's been eating only a thousand calories and is a mess hormonally, but I'm definitely coming from a place where my body is adapted to low calorie. And so the first strategy was, okay, go and hit the protein intake, right? Send a loud signal to build muscle, go hit the protein intake. What I have found was as I was slowly increasing protein, because I was so low on that, in order for me to hit my 200 grams of protein, Sal, I've got to be around 2,800 calories. So I was only at like 2,000, then I was at 2,500, then I'm at, and at 2,800, I barely get to my 200. So here I am, I've been creeping up, I'm finally hitting my protein intake, I'm building a little muscle, I'm stronger, I feel good, it's like, but I still want to get shredded, so should I cut right now? Well, the reason why I don't want to cut from 2,800 is if I go down to 2,400, now I'm going to start missing my protein intake mm -hmm. again. So I, my goal now is to be continue to reverse diet until I'm more like a place like 3,500 calories so that I can pull back to 3,000 or 2,800 without lowering, without lowering my protein. And I'm eating it in, in a place where I feel satisfied. So I think this is a, a, a missing a piece or conversation that I haven't added to talking about how I reverse diet somebody and then cut them back. It's like, I want to get them high enough. Now, typically what I'd say before is I would always push a client like, I'm going to keep pushing them, reverse diet them until they look back at me and they go, Adam, this is just so much food. I can't eat. I don't want to eat anymore. This is too much for me. And then I go, great. We're in a good place now. Let's go the other direction. Right. That was kind of my generic way of saying it before. But now I have an even, I think, more precise way to co co communicate this. And it's like, Wherever you we've told you your 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 protein intake. So let's let's use a, a, probably more of a, a female number of like protein intake. Probably a 140, 150, right? If a if a woman wants to be around 140, 150 pounds, let's just say okay, that's a, a healthy weight. Let's say so 140 is her number. Well, if I tell you I just want you to eat and and prioritize pro protein, you have to ask yourself about how many calories do you land at 
to, in order to hit that 140. And that probably is going to be somewhere in the 2,000, 2,300 range at least. So if you need 22, 2,300 calories just to hit your minimum protein intake that I want you to hit, well, I want to keep pushing your calories up higher in, so that when I cut you, I can cut you down to a number mm. that is sustainable calorie-wise and also realistic that you can still hit your protein intake. Yeah, so I, I love that. And, and again, and to add to that, like you want to go up to a place with your calories. And what you should notice, by the way, while you're doing this is you're just getting stronger. You're building muscle. You're getting stronger. You're feeling good. When you get to a place that you can drop calories from and feel comfortable that's the other thing to consider. It's like, okay, I'm at 2,000 calories. I can go down to 1,500 and be good. Or I'm at 2,200 calories. I can go down to 1,700 calories and be okay. Then you know you can start to cut. But if you're at a place where you're like, if I drop calories from here, I'm going to feel terrible, you got to keep reverse dieting. Next question, how can I tell if I'm overtraining and what are the signs to watch for? Excessive fatigue, soreness. stiffness, soreness, Sore. insomnia, uh, you're not getting stronger in the gym. Uh, you feel you just don't feel good. Hot, cold, intolerance. Mm -hmm. You feel run down. The, these fine. are the signs uh, of overtraining. Insomnia being the first one, by the way. Once you start overtraining, you'll notice your sleep is just off. Um, and it just means you, you just need to cut down on the volume and the intensity. Yeah, I mean, I feel like uh, one of the first is chronic soreness. I feel mm -hmm. like that's yeah. normally the first yeah. one I notice is just like I'm sore all the time. I'm going into a workout and I'm Achy still joints. sore. From, yeah. yeah, I'm still sore from the previous one. It's like, okay... To me, that's the way I look at my training nowadays is that I want I want to feel the workout that I did the, the day before, but that's it. I just want to feel that I trained that muscle. I don't want to feel to where I'm so sore, it's time to go work out again that month, and I still feel like I'm really sore. Otherwise, I have to really scale back on the intensity in that workout coming forward. So to me, that's always like the first sign of probably overtraining is that, but definitely disrupted sleep, definitely insomnia. Those are classic signs of that happening. But even just chronic soreness, like people tend to chase soreness as this metric of you'd had a good workout. And I don't believe that at all. I think it's actually normally a sign of you overreached and you did more than you needed to do. And so that to me is one of the first signs you see before you start to see the other ones that are really debilitating. Next question. What's the difference between muscle loss and fat loss? And how do I ensure I'm losing fat, not muscle? All right. So the, the difference on the scale, you can't tell, right? You lose 10 pounds on the scale of muscle, 10 pounds of body fat looks the same. So how do I know if it's muscle or body fat? Well, Gage it's two things. Strength. Yeah, yeah. One is that, exactly. Like, are you losing strength? Then you're losing muscle. Are you gaining strength and you lost some weight on the scale? You probably didn't lose muscle. The second way is a body fat percentage test. Mm -hmm. And you want to do these on a semi-regular basis, maybe every two weeks, doing them at the same time of the day, same amount of food and water, keep things consistent, and then pay attention to the trends. And that'll tell you, if you're losing muscle or body fat, that's one way to decipher it. Yeah. And another thing is this is like, so this is why the first point I made about getting your protein intake up and making sure that even when you're in a cut, you're still hitting your protein, right? Because chances are, if you're lifting, if you're, if you're strength training, you're hitting your protein intake and you're losing weight in the scale, you're probably losing fat. I mean, if you're if you're doing those things, hitting your unless you're doing especially some, if you're maintaining strength, yeah, especially strength. if you're mainly, yeah. even if you're not gaining strength, because it's it's normal to lose a little bit of strength sometimes when you're in a deficit. So it's yeah. not totally like the just because you lost a little bit of strength means you definitely lost muscle. But typically, if you're hitting that protein intake that your body needs, you're strength training at least three times a week, and the scale weight's going down slowly. That's normally a pretty good sign. But I think a, another way is when the when the scale moves fast. Scale just you you don't lose body fat fast. You do not lose five six pounds of fat at a time. It just doesn't happen. Our bodies don't work that way. So normally, if you see fast weight loss on the scale, you're not only losing fat, you're also paring down muscle because that's just how it works. You're not. I don't want to see that scale move more than about one to two pounds a week with a client. That's doing perfect. Any more than that, aside from the initial water weight loss yeah, or the beginning of the diet, now. because that's, of course, there's that's factored yeah, you lose in. water right away. Yeah, for very first week, you could see a major fluctuation up or down, a changing a diet for sure because of water. But I mean, after you've been training for a while, if all of a sudden you, I see a, a five, seven pound drop in a week, I'm adjusting my client's calories. I'm like, oh shit, that we cut too much. We got to go back up because you're certainly not losing seven pounds of fat in a week. That's just not happening. Next question is, how does sleep impact fat loss? What practical steps can I take to improve my sleep quality? Well, I mentioned that study earlier. Uh, it, could, it could cut your fat loss efforts in half and double the muscle loss that may potentially happen if your sleep is poor. So good sleep dramatically improves uh, your, your ability to burn body fat and maintain or keep muscle. 
in both directions. So if it's good sleep, you're going to get great, better results. You get bad sleep, you're going to get far worse results. Now, how do you improve your sleep quality? Black out your room. Make sure the temperature is very cool. Make sure you didn't eat any food uh, about a couple hours before. You're not on electronics about an hour before. Um, and sometimes white noise can help people out. And go to bed at the same time every night. Those are the big rocks that can, and then no caffeine past a certain point oh for God, most people's past sure. noon. Yeah. You know, yeah, this it's it's so interesting to me because it's like one of the easiest ways to impact sleep quality is to treat it the same way you treat getting up. Yep. I mean, just it's like the ritual of it. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's like we just we have it's so our culture has no ritual around getting ready for bed, but we have a, a definitely a strong ritual around getting up. I mean, we have there's fucking a thousand books written about how to make millions of dollars by your your morning routine. I mean, there's yeah. all kinds of that shit, but there's like not a lot written around that. Like, just care about it. Like, literally, just think about it. The way the way you think about getting up to get ready for work, to brush your teeth, to shower, to be out the door by a certain time. Like, you mm -hmm. know. Everybody listening to this right now knows exactly what time that alarm has to go off in order for them to do the things they need to do before they go out the door, whether that's getting kids ready or yourself or lunch or whatever it is, you have figured that out because you've put enough time thinking about it. If you just apply that same attention yeah. to the evening of, I got to do the X, Y, Z, I have to have my dinner by this time, I turn off my television by this time, I'm in my bed by this time, I like my temperature around here, yeah. and I do that consistently you're going to get great. You're going to start to Whatever get great. Whatever that sleep. formula is that works best for you. And yeah. that's the thing. You just have to be intentional. About that's it. it. Yeah. And, uh, and, and consistent. So that's, that's the other part of it is just like, once you nail it to just ritualize it. So that way too, you can duplicate it. And then this becomes something that, you know, really, uh, you know, has a massive effect on everything else, uh, leading forward. Perfect. All right. I know you liked that episode. If you did check this one out, 30% body fat for men. This is way too high. This is actually a bit high for women as well. So in today's episode, we're talking about how you can go from 30 to 10. What is 10% body fat? This is when you have a visible six pack. Can you go from 30 to 10%? Yes, it's possible, but not if you guess along the way. So we're going to talk about how you can do that in today's episode. Now, there's a huge range, right, of like body types. Yes. Some people can run uh, a little bit heavier uh, and, or a little bit higher body